Sense of His love, joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him anew. And heaven and nature sing. of His love All of heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love He rules the world with truth and peace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love All heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love All heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love of His love All of heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love Joy to the world The Lord is come Let earth receive her of His love All of heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love All of heaven and all creation say The wonders of His love All of heaven and all creation say The wonders of Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's try that again. I'll take the ears out. Good morning. Good morning. That works. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. We welcome you to St. Paul. And uh, this is a special morning for us. This is our uh, last Sunday this morning before we come back to this church on our uh, Christmas Eve services and really welcome in the birth of Jesus. But this morning, you are the choir, and we just ask that you would uh, welcome each other here and... Uh, Pump each other up and help us sing the next couple of songs. Welcome. That is your cue for talking and there you go. <laughs> So oh. 
Silent Night. Silent Night. Holy Night. All is gone. All is bright. Brown young virgin mother and child. Holy infant so I'd like to pray for just a moment. If you would, bow your heads. Gracious God, we are so grateful to be here this morning in your presence. We have families with us that aren't normally together. We have friends that come to worship you on a special time of year. We just ask that you would make all of us one connected family with each other. Uh, even if we have people that are not here with us, Lord, you connect us through your Holy Spirit. And we pray that uh, the words that we sing are pleasing to your ears and soften our hearts and make us prepared for worship today. Uh, we thank you in all things. In Christ's name, amen.
Please be seated. When they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed. When they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. From the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace peace when there is no peace. We look for peace, but no good came for a time of healing, but behold terror, the way of peace they have not known for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. For we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for he himself is our peace. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Good morning. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Thank you for coming. Let me uh, read our scripture passage today from the book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and uh, follow along or you can take our connection card. By the way, our connection card, uh, we would appreciate if you tear off the bottom, fill this out, drop it in the offering bags at the end of the service. Um, uh, Feel free to put your prayer requests on the back. As a staff, we take your prayers and the the honor of praying with you uh, seriously. Our passage comes from the book of Luke, and I'd like to... uh, Read it for you today. In the sixth month, now that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city, Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask, O oh God, that the power of the Holy Spirit be present to allow us to hear not just words on a page, but the message of gospel truth. For we, O oh God, are your servants, and we are your uh, people, and we, O oh God, Rest in the arms of the Almighty. It is in your name we pray. Amen. I think it's important that when we read Scripture, that we actually find ourselves in the text. Now, I mean this literally. I think it's important that we literally find ourselves 
place ourselves in the text. And what happens is that we begin to see from different perspectives. We get to see, for the first time maybe, what was going on behind the scenes. Living life from your own vantage point is a dangerous thing. And when we read Scripture from only one vantage point, it becomes as equally as dangerous. So in our passage, it's been commonly suggested that maybe you find yourself in Mary's shoes. What would it have been like to be Mary, to be minding your own business, and all of a sudden an angel appears? To hear a message that almost seems impossible, let alone the fact of a message that's directed to you where you truly believe that Susie or Julie down the street would be better suited for such a message. What would it have been like to be Mary's parents? To not actually have witnessed the angel Gabriel coming and giving this message, but to hear from her daughter that, the, that she's pregnant and, oh, by the way, an angel said that God did it. What about Mary's friends? Now Joseph, Joseph's parents, Joseph's friends, maybe to see from a community participant. Maybe you just heard the gossip about Mary and Joseph. Imagine yourself literally in the text. What do you see? What emotions do you feel from each vantage point? Probably one of the participants of this story that I had never imagined to sit in his shoes was the angel. Frederick Buchner writes this about Mary and himself, the, the angel. Mary struck the angel Gabriel as hardly old enough to have a child at all, let alone this child. But he'd been entrusted with a message to give her, and he gave it. He told her what the child was to be named, who the child was to be, and a little bit of the mystery that was to come upon her. And these are Gabriel's words. You mustn't be afraid, Mary, he said. And as he said it, now listen to this perspective. And as he said it, he only hoped that she wouldn't notice that beneath the large and huge wings that he himself was trembling to fear, with fear to think that the whole future of God's plan rested in the answer of a little girl. What a perspective. If you dig a little bit into that, you could imagine that maybe some of the fear, the trembling, was Gabriel's doubting a little bit of God's methods. If you're Mary, you most certainly probably would have found yourself doubting God's methods. Joseph, you know, even in this passage, it is entirely filled with people who had good reason to doubt God's methods. And almost certainly... These caused the people to find themselves in a way who had to trust something beyond themselves. To trust a method or a plan that was beyond their ability to see. So Mary, here's this message. And what the angel comes and says to Mary is this. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, I want to just stop here for just a second and say that every, neck, every other time that the angel comes to somebody, they start out with the words, do not be scared. <laughs> after, after Gabriel says this, Gabriel was able to see in Mary that she was scared. Now, we'll get to that in just a second. Notice what Gabriel says to Mary. Two things 
Mary, you are favored. It's not that she is the only favored. She is reminded by Gabriel that she, part of God's family, she is one of the ones who are favored. And notice the second thing that Gabriel says. The Lord is with you. And I don't think it's any mistake that Gabriel uses the word Lord to identify the one who is with her. All through the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, you find people who are writing to God and they are identifying God in such a way and in such a, a, a description that they need to hear. For instance, David, you will find, is talking to God about a rock, a fortress, when he feels that the, the ground beneath him is slipping. And Gabriel uses this word Lord, and Lord is the word that God uses to identify himself as I am or Yahweh. It is the word in Genesis chapter 2 that describes God as the one who is, um, who is creating out of the hands and out of the intimacy of blowing and breathing into the all. What you see is the intimacy of God. Anytime you see the word Lord, especially in the Old Testament, it is conveying a message to the reader that the writer wants you to hear the intimacy of God. And this is what Gabriel says to Mary. Not only are you favored, but the Lord, the intimate God, is with you. It's almost an emphatic way to say is, God is next to you. You're not alone. God is with you. And what happens is that Mary responds in a way that she doesn't even have to say a word. Gabriel is able to see on her face the emotions of fear. Now, this is not too far-fetched for us because we can look at somebody and we could tell what emotions they were feeling. If you saw somebody in a certain way, you would say, oh, that person is happy or that person is scared. That person is... Those of us who have been married for any point of time, does your spouse have to say a word for you to know that they are irritated with you? No. They don't have to say a word because you can tell. And the word here that is used is only used here once to describe not just that Mary was troubled, but this word that gives the idea that it stretched and went to every nook and cranny of her body. There was only one time that I can remember that I've ever felt scared, distressed, troubled so much. It was about 25 years ago or some odd years ago, 20 years ago, and my dad used to work in a, uh, a pharmacy that was 30 miles away from home. And one night it was late, he was, he was late coming home. It was snowing, it was icing, icing over. And, and so mom says, drive up and see what's keeping dad so long. This is before the time of having cell phones and things where you could just kind of text and call. And I remember 20 minutes up the road, I saw a flatbed wrecker coming the other way with what I saw was my dad's truck. And at that moment, every fabric of my body, every muscle tensed up, every part of me was troubled. Because I started to assume the worst. To make a long story short, it was my dad's truck, but he was fine. You undoubtedly know what it's like to be in a moment where your whole body is troubled. And this is what Mary is going through. And being able to see this, what Gabriel says is, listen, do not be afraid, Mary. And once again, he uses this idea of God's proximity, God's closeness. You have found favor, not with the Lord this time, but with God. And any time in the in scriptures that God is used, 95% of the time, the writer wants the reader to hear the power of God. That's why in Genesis 1, it talks about God speaking into the nothingness and creation leaping into existence. So in her distress, she 
was told by the, Gabriel, by the angel Gabriel, now not only is the intimate one with you, but the one who is able to speak into existence is with you. Gabriel reminds Mary that there is a God who is in her narrative. I think that it is dangerous for anybody to think too highly of themselves. Would you not agree? But I think it's as equally as dangerous to think less of yourself than God does. See, what happens is extraordinary people see themselves as God sees them. There was nothing special. These were not spiritual giants, the men and the women of Scripture. They were just men and women who believed that God actually was with them. That God was actually a part of their narrative. Even when they were not able to see it. Let me give you a great example of this in the Old Testament. The book of Judges is a book about the people of Israel doing what is right, sinning, then God delivers them over to an enemy. They suffer. When they come to their senses, they cry out to God, and God sends a deliverer. It's cyclical. It goes over and over and over and over again. It's about 400 years, the book of Judges, of this over and over again. In Judges chapter 6, the writer of Judges starts describing one of these times where God delivered them over to their enemies. The Midianites, the distant cousins of the Israelites, were oppressing them in such a way that the writer says that any time that there was food to be harvested, the Midianites would come in and steal it with force, not by night. They would come in with their swords and with, with force, and they would steal this food and take it. So much that the people of Israel found themselves living in the caves, in the mountains, in the holes. And here comes on scene a guy named Gideon. And what is he doing? He is taking care of wheat. He's threshing wheat. And what he's doing is he's threshing wheat in a wine press. Now that is very, a, not very a, of a typical thing to do. You, you didn't find yourself in a hole, which was usually what an, a, a wine press was, or in a barn doing this to wheat. You did it out in the fields so that the chaff could blow away and stuff like that. Be, but because of the Amalekites and because of the Midianites, Gideon was scared. An angel came to him. Notice what the angel said. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, if you could imagine the perspective of Gideon, finding yourself hiding, finding yourself kind of peeking out, looking at Seaver's enemies and stuff like that, and then kind of hiding back down again, would you see yourself as a mighty man of valor? What's interesting here is that the angel sees and reminds Gideon of how God sees him. You see, you and I find ourselves in instances where we are living into the perspective of ours and we see ourselves 
as we would normally, as we normally would, and, and we start living within our own realm of what we think is going on. And like we read scripture, of seeing the different perspective, it is a quality of someone who does extraordinary things for God, who is able to step back and see a bigger picture. Because if you're like me, you find out, or you have, you have decided that sometimes God's methods are not very, well, they're not that well planned out, we think. And we think that because we're living in our perspectives. And what we need to do as men and women, as children of God, is to remind ourselves not only that we are part of his, his family, that we are favored, but that we are not alone. You see, extraordinary people do extraordinary things when they know that they're not doing it on their own strength. I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't want to be extraordinary. Now, you might have some questions about that, but just maybe you want your spouse to be extraordinary. Maybe you want your children to be extraordinary. Maybe you want your boss to be extraordinary. Maybe you want this, this idea that, that they live beyond themselves. They are able to see something bigger. They see themselves as God sees them. Greatness for God's kingdom will only come when we are able to see ourselves as chosen, as part of God's family, and as not alone. The thrill of Christmas is the hope that we have that God is with you. Let us pray. And so, O oh God, we pray that this would be your message, and that as you seal it in our hearts, that you would allow us, O oh God, to carry it with us. What is from you, may it stick. What is not from you, may it fall to the ground and shatter. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Excelsis Deo Gloria In Excelsis Deo Him whose birth the angels sing Come adore on bended knee Christ the Lord, the newborn King Gloria In excelsis Deo Chelsea's day My friends, hear this benediction. May the God of peace who is with you and who has reminded you over and over again that you were his. Be the God who continues to hold you in the palm of your hand during this Christmas season and beyond. Go now in peace. Amen.